Good morning and welcome to Tracy Finn United Methodist Church, our worship service. You know, it seems a little bit strange to me that I'm talking to a camera and we have in-person worship this morning. And my tendency is to look at everyone and forget that the virtual community is out there, so I promise you I won't forget you. But we want to welcome you this morning. Uh, I hope your uh, anticipation, anticipation is high. I'm going to climb higher and higher and higher, and I hope we all get to the same place together. Blessings on you. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Good morning, and welcome to Tracy and United Methodist Church. Today is Sunday, June 6th. 2021 Pentecost Sunday the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all let us pray breathe on us breath of God this morning as we bend our hearts knees and lift praise to you good shepherd you are the source of true of uh, true and lasting joy we praise you for your power which is beyond compare we worship you with your kingdom which is beyond understanding. We restore the brokenhearted and heal the wounded. You have revealed yourself to the people and are building your church. Against you, nothing can prevail. How great you are. Hear our prayers with love. We open our hearts to your word. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. And now for the prayer of elimination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. 
Good morning. Our first reading is out of Samuel chapter 8, 4 through 11, 12 through 15, 16 through 20, and out of chapter 11, 14 through 15. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us, then, a king to govern us like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Just as they have done to me from the day I brought them up out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so also they are doing to you. Now then, listen to their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some of plow to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to the courtiers. He will take one-tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and his courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourself. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel and they said, No, but we are determined to have a king over us so that we also may be like other nations. And that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. Samuel said to that people, Come, let us go to Gilgal and then renew the kingship. So all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. There they sacrificed offerings of well-being before the Lord, and there Saul and all the Israelites rejoiced greatly. Word of the Lord. Psalm 138. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased my strength of soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he but the haughty he perceives from far away. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you have preserved me against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch out your hand, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. 2 Corinthians 4, 13 through 5, 1. But just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with Scripture, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight, momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure, because we look not at what we can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, and what cannot be seen is eternal. 
For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with his hands, eternal in the heavens. Word of the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, as now, and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. <clears throat> the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Then he went home, and the crowd came together again, so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, that is Jesus, for people were saying, he's gone out of his mind. He's beside himself. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons, he cast out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan if a kingdom is divided against itself? That kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. But his end has come. But the one can enter a strong man, but no one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven their sins and whatever blasphemies they may utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they said he had a demon. When his mother and brothers came, and standing outside, they went to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers and sisters? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother, my brothers, my sisters. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. So in the, in the reading of the Old Testament, Samuel, all those words that you, you listen to, but the essence of that was just simply say, God is saying to his people, I, I, I want to be your king. I want to be in relationship. They said, no, 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 we, we don't want you. We want to be like other nations and have our own king. So we'll pick a king, thank you very much. Because they want to be like other nations. And that's the problem. And then in the psalm, it was basically to praise God. The Corinthian... Uh, letter is talking about vision, seeing and not seeing. And then in the gospel lesson, uh, here we have demons and strange language. What's all that about? What does that mean? Um, I'll put it simply. It means the means by which you get to a place has been blocked off. So if you want to cross the bridge and the bridge is down, you can't get to the other side, right? And all Jesus is saying, if you think I'm a demon, I'm the means of your salvation. If you think my bridge is down, you can't get across. So it's not like we, did we commit a sin against the Holy Spirit? You can't do that. What you can do is reject God. And as long as you reject God, there's no bridge. And that doesn't mean just for Christians, that means for anyone. 
So don't, don't think of that as, oh, I gotta worry about what acts and what am I saying, and am I gonna commit this eternal sin that I can never be forgiven? You can't do that unless you reject the means of grace by which you can have a relationship with God. But I wanna focus this morning on this other part of the, the text. Um, when Jesus said, uh, remember they, they, they heard, the family heard that Jesus was beside himself. The Greek word means divine madness. It's, it's like your mind is outside of your brain. When you fall in love, that's what happens. Your mind goes outside of your brain and mother's nature way of fooling you into getting married. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, uh, so I wanna focus on the question, who are the outsiders and who are the insiders? And so let's just focus on that. Many of you know that my parents were deaf. My mother was a deaf uh, person uh, who had to learn to listen with her eyes because she couldn't hear. So one day, uh, I came home from summer school. I was in ninth grade, and uh, she, used, she loved her soap operas. She just loved to watch soap, but, but she couldn't hear. So I decided to sit down next to her, and I turned the sound off. For, you, you, had to, you didn't have remotes in those days. You had to get up and go to the TV and you know, turn it down. So I, I turned it down, and I sat next to her, and I held her hand. And we just watched the soap opera together. Now, I couldn't hear what was going on, and I, I can't read lips, and all of a sudden, I had no idea what they're talking about. I had no idea what's going on. I, I was lost in watching this program, and I was getting bored. And so I turned to my mother, and I said, do you, do you know, because I feel, if I'm bored, and I don't know what's going on, my mother certainly would be bored, and she wouldn't know. So I turned to my mother, and I said, Mom, it's all in sign language. No, no verbal, all sign language. I said, Mom, do you, do you understand? What's, and she began to tell me everything that was going on. And I thought to myself, ah, she's, she, what she's doing is she's watching and she's making up her own fantasy about what's going on and she's created her own story. So, but you know, I, I, I went over and I turned the sound back up. It took me a few minutes to pick up on what was going on. And I, I was amazed and how accurate my mother was. And I said to mom, I said, how did you know? Now she looked at me in a way that only mothers can look at their children as if I know something you don't know. How'd you ever have that with your mom or dad? Or maybe not, but I did. My mom was always one of those that would look at me because when you're a kid, ninth grade, eighth grade, seventh grade, you know everything. Mom and dad doesn't know anything. They just don't, they don't understand. They don't know what it's like to be a kid in school. So she, she, she knew that. And she just looked at me with those eyes and that little smile, a little crooked smile that she would get on her face. And I know I, I knew something was coming. And she said to me in sign language, son, you need to learn how to listen with your eyes. You need to learn how to listen with your eyes. So that's the, that's the title of the sermon today. Learning how to listen with your eyes. Becoming aware of the word which stands behind the words. Obviously, my mom did not hear the words. What she grasped with her eyes was the word that stand behind our words. Now sometimes we become so fixed and so stuck on words that we can't get beyond that. Because the only way you can get beyond the words to the word that stand behind is a vision. Seeing with your eyes. I remember the story, you remember the story of Cornelius and and uh, he, he was a centurion, retired, living in Joppa, and he had a vision. I don't know if we knew what that vision was, but what, what he heard in that vision was, go call Peter. Now, there is a tradition that says this Cornelius, so you remember in the Gospel of Mark, 
when there was a centurion after he had inflicted injury and pain and suffering on Jesus, and then when he gave up his spirit on the cross, it was the centurion who said, truly, this is the Son of God. Many believe that that's the same centurion, Cornelius, who had favor with God, who believed in God, but didn't understand what was going on. And then he was told to send two people to Caesarea where Peter was. And so they went to Caesarea and they're yelling out, because they don't know where he lives. They're yelling out, Peter, 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 or maybe Cephas, Cephas. So Peter heard. But before he heard them, Peter had a vision. Now remember, Peter, uh, Peter's faith, he's, he's a Jewish person. He's, he's steeped in Jewish tradition. Uh, he, he's not, you know, practicing Christianity as you and I know it, although he's a follower of Jesus and is considered the, you know, the uh, first leader of the church in those days. But he's still steeped in his tradition. And one day, he's, he's in a trance, it says. Now, I don't know if it's a trance, the Greek word, actually has something to do with exodus, ecstasy. It, it, it means to be, to be let out, to go, like exodus. They, they went. They were freed from their bondage. So in one sense, he's up in this exodus experience, I'll say, and a vision came down, and the vision was of, of animals, the kind that you don't eat according to the law of the Torah. It would be a violation of his own principles. But he has this vision, and he's probably repulsed by all the different animals that he's not allowed to eat. But then a voice speaks in this vision. Now, whether the voice is using words or it's something that he heard with his heart, we don't know. But he heard this. God said, what I have declared clean how dare you say it's unclean? And Peter began to think about that and say, well, this is going against my religious principles. This is going against my faith. But God, God said, it's okay. It's okay to partake of this food. Now, at that precise moment, See, that's, those are the words. That's the vision. But we don't know what the word behind that is, right? So at that precise moment, the two guys from, from Cornelius are calling out, Peter, Peter, Cephas, where are you, where are you? And he looks out, and he notices something about them. They are Gentiles. And Gentiles are considered unclean, just like the animals in the vision. I can't eat that stuff. I'm repulsed by that stuff. And now all of a sudden, they're calling out my name, and now he's hearing the word that stands behind the word. It's not about animals. It's not about what you're eating. It's about the Gentiles that you are going to reach now. You're going to break down this barrier that separates us from them. You're going to bridge. You're going to walk across this bridge and enter into a relationship with what would be considered unclean people. And so he invites them up, they talk, and then he goes with them to Cornelius' home. A thing that you just don't do if you're a Jew. You don't enter into a Gentile home in those days. It would be anathema. It would be against God. And yet he had this vision. So now he has to take his faith and step into his vision, which is contrary to his faith. Because now his faith is going to open up. It's going to expand. It's going to be more inclusive. It's going to be, it's, the horizons are growing. And, and I'm sure he is confused. And I'm sure he's feeling insecure. But he decides one thing. Peter decides one thing. Because without it, you have no faith. And that is to trust. I am going to trust this vision and I'm going to step outside of my box, my faith tradition. I'm going to step outside and I'm going to enter into that vision. And if you enter into that vision, then the vision will take you to places you never thought you would go. And he enters into Cornelius' house. 
And he began, so Cornelius is asking him all kinds of questions about Jesus and all of that. And I think, forgive me, I think God got bored with what Peter was saying. Because in the middle, middle of his talk, he sends the Holy Spirit upon the Gentiles and they saw the manifestation and Peter's going, wow, God, you did for them what you did for us on the day of Pentecost in the upper room. How can I deny them water? How can I deny them access to you? How can I deny them entrance into the faith, the family? I can't because they have the same spirit that I receive that we all receive when we follow Christ. So that happened. Now, here's the problem. Peter's got to go back to Jerusalem to the Christian, not Judaism, but the Christian council, church council. So he goes back to the church council because they had heard, what are you doing, Peter? These are unclean people. They have to become Jews first in order to become a Christian. See, that's what it was. You have to become Jewish first in order to become a Christian. And instead of Peter arguing, instead of people, tr Peter trying to convince them, he simply shared his story. He shared his experience. And what he told them is exactly what had happened. And the council got it. They said, well, if God sent the Holy Spirit upon Gentiles, like he did us, we can't exclude them anymore. We have to include them. We have to welcome them. And that is like a paradigm shift. So how do you know when you are listening with your eyes? If you listen with your ears only, you're going to be inside that box. But when you learn to listen with your eyes, then you step outside of that box, or your box is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. I was talking to a, a group of men not long ago, and uh, someone opened up, because we, we were looking at this and sharing about uh, the African-American community. And I could tell you could see he was emotional. You could see that he had fear and trepidation in his body language. I could see that. And he, he made a confession. He said, I think I'm prejudiced. Tell me more. Well, if I were to see African Americans on a, walking down the street, I would be afraid. I would really be afraid. And I said, okay, let's explore this a little bit more. Tell me about why you're afraid. I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to get killed. And I said, so what you're telling me, you just prefer to live. And it's your fear that has gripped your heart. I think you're right. I said, just suppose you sat down with these gentlemen that you have in your mind and you begin to have a conversation, different cultures, different backgrounds, but you hear the common thread of humanity. You hear the common thread of home and children and family struggling to make ends meet, working hard, can't find a job. You start to hear things I said, what would happen in, in, if that were the case? He said, well, my fear would go away. And I could probably have a relationship with them. And I said, you see, you may have prejudice, but remember, prejudice is only preference, right? If I have my son and his friend are in a place in which I could only save one of them, I can't save them both, and I have to make a choice, I would choose my son. That's my preference. I would feel guilty and terrible about the other person, but I would choose because that's my family. And I said, what I told him, I said, all you did is you, 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 you have a preference to live. It's your fear that grips you. 
So how do you diminish the fear? And this is what I'm trying to get at. When you're able to share your experiences, when you're able to share your stories, you connect with other people. I've been telling you for weeks, we need to connect our story to the gospel story so that there's a transformation of our own narrative. Because when the two mingle together, something happens. Well, it's the same thing. When you meet someone that may be of a different color, a different sexual orientation, or whatever it might be, you have certain apprehensions and fear. Maybe not everyone, but some people do. And when you start to have conversation and you find out they're just as human as I am and their needs are just as valid as my needs, then there's a connection that's made and it transforms the narrative for you and for the other person as well. Years ago, uh, I was a pastor in a church in California and there's a program that we implemented, it was called a discovery program. Uh, and then the idea of this discovery program is once another church comes to your church and gifts you with this gift, then your task is to continue to pass it on. The idea is go to different churches. So I got a call from a Long Beach church and said, hey, I heard about this program. Would you, would you guys like to come to our church? And I said, sure. He said, but I got to tell you. She said, I got to tell you, this is a reconciling congregation. And we have many, many uh, gay people uh, we have many that are dying of AIDS, quite frankly, because this is back in the late 80s, early 90s. And so I said, and this church I was pastoring was a very conservative church, very conservative. And so I didn't think it was going to fly, to be honest. I, I didn't have much hope that this was going to happen. But I called for a church council. I laid it with the people that are principally involved in this. I laid it all out to them. And at first they resisted, but then one of the ladies stood up and said, wait a minute, maybe God is calling us to this church to share with them the gospel of Christ. Now, I don't know what her motive was. I don't know what was in her head. So then it was decided we would go. Then I invited the pastor from that church to come down and explain what's going on. So we went. And after we had this marvelous weekend, we did a debriefing back at the church. I was kind of curious to see what, what they were going to talk about. And there was one person that said this, and it made the whole weekend worth it. There were many, many beautiful stories that occurred. But this is what he said. He said, you know, in a debriefing, I had a preconceived idea of what gay and that community was about. And I just thought it was sin. I just thought it was terrible. He said, you know, but when I sat at my table and talked with these people, he said, they were, they were like my brothers and sisters. And he said, all this fear I had about AIDS and all that, because that was pretty rampant in those days, just kind of fell down. And he said, in fact, I'm going to go visit this couple two male couples, I'm going to go visit them. I'm going to bring my grandchildren so that my grandchildren won't have the stigma that I've had all my life. How did that happen? I, I don't know what the words were in that table where he sat, but what I think he is saying, I got in touch with the word behind the words. And when you get in touch with the word behind the, the words, then you are seeing with your eyes, and guess what happens when you see with your eyes? You begin to see how God sees people. And I'm gonna tell you, it's gonna be a lot different than what you think it is. Because God is pure love, pure acceptance, pure healing, pure reconciliation. And guess what? That God believes in you, you, and you. And that God wants to speak to you, not only in words, but with vision. And if you're just open to praying, Lord, let your vision envelop me, that I might see what you see, that I might act 
how you would want me to act toward all humanity. Toward all humanity. That we may all be filled with the same spirit that Christ brings to us. Amen. Amen. I'm going to say a little prayer, but I'm going to quote Psalm 19, and you'll get the flavor of this as I read it. The heavens are telling a story. I don't hear any voice out there. But the heavens are telling a story. They're telling the story of the glory of God, says the writer. And the firmament proclaims his handiwork. What's the firmament? The earth. The earth has a story to tell. So when someone says, I don't know if I can have a vision, just open your eyes and notice what's going on around you. Notice the people. What feelings are evoked by what you see? Then investigate why you feel the way you do. Say the words that you need to say, and then say, God, what is your word that stands behind my words, that my words could be transformed into a different story, a new story that reflects God's story. Amen. This is uh, the Lord's table. The difference between fellowship table and an altar. So I, I put this altar back here. Altar is always a sacrifice. What you give, what you, what you do, how you live your life, how you serve each other, how Jesus served us, the cross. The cross, the altar, then invites us to fellowship at the table. And guess what? You're all invited to come and partake and participate in the fellowship of God's table because this is God's table, not my table, not the Methodist table, not your table. This is God's table. And God, the word that stands behind the word, says, You're all welcome. Come. But Lord, I don't know if I'm right. Come. But Lord, I come. You're all invited with all that we are and all that I am, because it's in partaking of the fellowship of the table that healing occurs and transformation is possible. So this is the invitation to Holy Communion. As was said earlier, I'll be breaking bread up here, but and, and we have the cups right here for you to take, but we ask you to take it on either outside or when you go home. And take extras for anyone else that you, you know and just tell them a story. You're invited to the table. I bring in the, I'm bringing the table to you. So, let us prepare ourselves by confession. Let us pray. Gracious God, forgive us and free us. Forgive our desires to be of this world instead of your kingdom. Forgive us our pride and self-absorption. Open our hearts and minds to learn again to live in your love as we celebrate and worship you here together. Open our hearts that we may learn that neither race nor tribe, culture or religion are barriers that separate us, but we are one, all in one family in your love. Direct us to be servants that we should be. Pour out your grace upon our lives. Help us to stay the path of righteousness. In the name of your Son, our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord is slow to anger, and he abounds in steadfast love. Let us change our hearts and minds and turn to the Lord who loves us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are all forgiven. And now, as a forgiven and reconciled people, let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God.
I hope you notice that the invitation to the table and the offertory is a part of communion. So that we are offering ourselves as a sacrifice of worship through our gifts and tithes and offerings and presents and all of that. So that's why we do uh, the invitation before we actually start the Lord of the Prayer, because it's all part of communion. Communion is basically we're responding to the Word of God, a call to communion, to be in relationship to one another. So let us pray. Lord on high, we lay on this altar a gift of thanksgiving and faith. You call us to a larger understanding of family, and we know that many in that family are in great need. Take our offerings through your power and spirit. May they be put to good use of easing that need. Hear our praise and the songs of hearts that glorify your name. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Indeed, it's a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks and praise to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, creator of humanity. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we join in their unending hymn saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus. He healed the sick, raised the dead. He raises us to new life and gives us a new narrative, transformation through faith in him. By the baptism of suffering, death, and resurrection, Death and uh, your suffering and death, you delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant. On the night that Jesus was, was betrayed, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, and he broke the bread as his body was broken upon the cross so that we may feast upon the heavenly banquet. In the same manner, he took the cup and gave thanks to you and gave the cup to the disciples and said, drink from this all of you, for this is a sign of the new covenant. What's the new covenant? That you love one another and love your neighbor as yourself. Take and drink from this all of you. And so with, so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living gift in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Hosanna in the highest. Now in the Wesleyan tradition, this is the moment that the bread and the cup are consecrated. That is, becomes for us the real presence of Christ in a vision. But this is the moment. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and in virtual community. And on these gifts of bread and wine, make them become for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might become the body of Christ to the world, so that they can have a vision of what it means to be a part of the family of God. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. And now with the confidence of the children of God, we are bold to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we partake of the one loaf. The bread that we break is the sharing the body of Christ. And the cup over which we give thanks is sharing the blood of Christ. 
the sign of the new covenant. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are they who are called to his table. Lord, we are not worthy to receive you. Only say the word and we shall be healed. O Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God, that takes away the sins of the world. Have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us your peace. Amen. That would be the time to receive. So the elements are consecrated. You'll, you'll come and we'll have them over there so when you leave you can pick them up and take it home or take it outside if you'd like. The body and blood of Christ given to us. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Holy mystery given to us. We pray that we might have faith, the faith of Abraham, and go wherever you lead us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Um, we have several prayer requests this morning. I, I want to, uh, Barbara Johnson here is this morning and she just informed me that Mary Jean? Mary Louise. Mary Louise, uh, who was one of the, I, I'll call them the, one of the four that sat right there, right there. Uh, her, she went to live with her daughter in, in the Spokane area and then she got COVID and died. And we didn't know that, but we, we lift her family up and those who know her, we lift you up in our prayers and we give thanks for you. And then, is it the other Barbara that hurt her shoulder? Yes. Yeah, so she's, in, she's having some work done and uh, Penny, bless her, she'll be with us one of these days. So we're all, I just wanna just acknowledge uh, people that are, have been, you know, we've been closed since March 8, 2020. And it's only been the last three weeks that we've opened up the doors and allow in-person worship. And I, I can almost see all the people that were here. And I know the people are not here. Bob Wilkich. Libby. Others that you can think of that are not here. Who? Yes. Yeah. Sarah yes. Other. We have lost some dear saints this past year, so we want to be mindful uh, of that. Uh, but I am so excited that you are here, and it's a new day, and we will move forward. And Ruth is new today. We're so delighted that you came, and she came because she saw this on on Facebook, right? Yep. There it is. Other prayers that we have this morning. My uh, memory is not as good as it used to be one upon a time. Prayers for a church member needing supporting, so needing our prayer support for healing of her inner peace for family. There's a parishioner's brother who's losing his fight and now dying in CT. We were just there visiting, now we're back. He needs prayers for peace in his family nearby. Thank you for continued prayers. Prayers for a friend whose grandson is dealing with drug addiction. He is currently in treatment. Please pray for a friend whose wife just had a stroke. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, you are a God of love and compassion. You know our needs. You know what's in our hearts and what's in our minds. You know all things. We, in this moment, pause to remember, to give thanks, and to pray. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. There is a um, Zoom uh, afterglow for those on in the virtual land, and, but anyone is welcome to participate here. So what we do is we take a few minutes of fellowship, then we gather somewhere, and then we talk about what did you hear in the sermon today? What did you like? What did you didn't like? Where, where do you need clarification? And we, we tell our story. We just swap stories. And I think when we do that, we draw closer to one another, right?
Okay. May the blessings of God Almighty be with you all in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. From my heart to your heart, until we meet again. Amen. Thank you.